Hey everybody, welcome to the Show Board Game Reviews. This is a YouTube channel all about the tabletop gaming hobby, and this is the first Monday show for October of 2021. This month we're going to talk about two great Kickstarter projects. That would be a great Christmas gifts because these are actually Kickstarters you can get before Christmas. I know it's a big shocker with Kickstarter, but these are two great Kickstarters that make some great, fantastic Christmas presents for the gamers in your life. And since this is October, this is a great time to start talking about some Halloween gaming. Come back for a great list of awesome games to play with all your friends after this Halloween. Now the great thing about this list is this is not going to be your typical top 10 games. This is going to be a list of Halloween games that are going to meet a whole bunch of criteria. I didn't sit down and just write and say, yep, this is my favorite game, it's my second favorite game, blah, 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 blah. No, this is a list that every one of the viewers out there can use. This is going to take games that are going to meet certain criteria, certain categories, or certain kinds of gameplay to give you a list of games that you can play on Halloween that you will enjoy. It doesn't matter who you are. Come on back after the break. This video is going to run long if we don't get things started, so let's go and start with the two gifts that are going to be great, fantastic Christmas presents for the gamer in your life. We know that all gamers love to bling out of board games. One of the most funnest things that we can ever do to a board game is just make the game look that much cooler on the tabletop. And that's why 3D printers are becoming so darn awesome. That's why we all enjoy using 3D printers. The price of them come down quite a bit. You can actually get a decent quality 3D printer for about $200 these days. And the filament's only about $20, and that's enough filament to create a whole bunch of things. So one of the really popular things that we're starting to see on Kickstarter these days are STL files. Now, if you're not familiar with 3D printers and STL files, well, 3D printers allow you to take plastic, PLA, or resin. I'm a huge fan of PLA, not a fan of resin at all. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a segue here. I just want to cover it so people know for people who don't know the difference. Resin is a chemical, right? a chemical that is fairly toxic. When you play with resin, you got to wear gloves, you got to wear a mask, you got to keep away from kids, all that good stuff. Those are all big no-nos in my house because I have a family, I have kids, I don't want that stuff in my house. PLA is a huge big difference. PLA is a plastic, just like resin, but the fact is it's a heck of a lot less toxic because of the makeup of the chemical and also the fact of the way the PLA 3D printers are designed is a heck of a lot less toxic to the point that you don't have to worry about touching and stuff. You don't have to specially cure it, you don't have to dip in alcohol and do all the work that resin does. The downside to PLA though is it has a little bit less of a quality detail. So you have a trade-off here. Do we have models that look not quite as good, but I don't have to worry about killing myself with toxins or well, do we go with the toxins? Yes, I know that if you have your special section, separate, separate section of the house, resin printers isn't a big deal. You can basically do it in the garage, but it's not something I'm willing to do. So I enjoy using PLA printers, and I have a PLA printer, a decent one. It's mono price. It's not the best in the world. If you want to know what's a good one, go check out the Enders. The Ender lines are some of the best 3D printers, especially when it comes to PLA, and they're also not that expensive. But the whole point of this that I'm trying to get at is you can use a PLA printer to bling out your board games really, really cool. You can do things such as making hit point dials for games such as Gloomhaven. You can make extra figures, extra pieces. You can make various different things or you can bling out your dungeon crawling games and making dungeon tiles and making landscapes and all these things. And that's why we're gonna look at Dragon Lock. STL printed files currently available on Kickstarter. Now this project, as of the time of this recording, has about eight days left. And when this recording goes live, it should have about six or seven days left on the project. And I'll leave a link down below. The really cool thing about this project is that once it funds, it's basically done by November. And this is a fantastic gift for anybody who is a gamer in your life who has a 3D printer, because you can make some extremely awesome things. Now, if you watched my last month's video or the first Monday show, you got to see me talk about how I'm starting to repurpose a lot of my board games to keep all the components to start playing all the games. I've been enjoying games such as Rangers of Shadowdale. I have actually Rangers of Shadowdeep, sorry about that. Also Frostgrave and other games like that. Just by re reusing the components I have, Billion Suns is another one. So using these 3D files that you can pre-order basically through this Kickstarter program, you can get some really cool 3D files for some amazing terrain that can make your board games or some of the games I've already mentioned look a heck of a lot better. Matter of fact, makes them look absolutely fantastic. Now, I've been a fan of Dragonlock for a heck of a long time. As a matter of fact, what you're seeing right here are some 3D STL files from some of the things you can get through Drive-Thru RPG. These aren't even available through the Kickstarter, meaning that you can go ahead and get these 3D files right here and right now. And I just want to show you how cool these are and how easy these are to put together. Basically, you're going to print out these plastic pieces. You can get some really cool things, such as you can get a building with working doors. 
And I know I don't have the rules on these, but the reason why I did is I wanted you to see that you can actually look inside. And if you're a tabletop RPG player or a board gamer, you can see that there's little individual squares inside that you can use for county movement. That's really super cool. But the awesome thing about this is this doesn't take that long or even take that much work to do. Basically, all I did was load up the 3D printer, download the files, put the files in the 3D printer, and walked away for about four and a half hours, and this is what you get. It's really cool, it's super easy, and super fun, and there's not much work that goes into it. And the nice thing about this is you can build tons and tons of different things. And again, I'm having to show you the stuff that's available in the Kickstarter. I'm gonna show you some images of that in just a moment because it looks super darn cool. And you can see how just using these things, you can bling out your board games and make them just darn look so awesome. But just what you can do here, just some examples of some things you can do if you want to build a large end, because let's say this house isn't big enough, you can use these clips that these were also 3D printed. Matter of fact, everything you're seeing right here, this is all 3D printed without any sanding. I didn't have to take sanders or work on this for hours to clean these up. They came out like this. This is hardly any work on my part. Of course, I had to use a little bit of a snips because these do have a brim on them, and I'm not going to get into the differences between brims and rafts. But basically, it holds a 3D print in place while it's printing, and you basically take this little piece, as you see right here, and I can pretty much tear it off with my thumbnail. It's not a big deal, but I like to use snips because it makes it look so much cleaner, and you can get rid of the edges, makes it look a little bit better. But, but once you print these things out, you can make larger ends, or you don't even have to make an end. What if you wanted to recreate some of the battlefields in Gloomhaven? You can print out a whole bunch of these sections and these little holes right here, there's a reason why they're there. And you can cover them. I have them open just so you can see just how easy this is to make this work. But you can connect a whole bunch of these together to remake some of the rooms from Gloomhaven. And when you remake these rooms from Gloomhaven, they look really darn cool. And it's a lot easier to deal with those little square pieces, those cardboard layers for the board game. This looks a heck of a lot better and it's a lot more fun because you can do things such as having the doors open but you can make larger walkways and stuff like this. You can also make walls. And the way these walls work is they are so darn super easy. Now these are the walls for an inn. If you want to get dungeon walls, cavern walls, all these things, they're currently available through drive through RPG, or you can check out the Kickstarter, which has price ranges. I think the cheapest is 25 all the way up to 95, but it comes with tons and tons of STL files. And these STL files you can reuse over and over and over again. Basically, I bought this once. This was $1.25 for this STL file right here, and I can use it until I'm sick of it. But this, this is just so super easy. You basically just take one of these supports, again, 3D printed, you stick it down in the house like this, and not a lot of effort, not a lot of work. They spin just a little bit. And the cool thing about this is, and I'll show you just in a second why this is so cool, but the easy part is to put these together. It slides in just like that. And now you can see that you could have a really cool tavern. You could have a dungeon wall if you use a different kind of textures or anything like this. You can make it look super duper cool. But the awesome thing and the best part about this is storage. If you want to, you can store these very easily because you just take them apart in their separate pieces, store them in some kind of container, and use them anytime you want. Now these dragon clips, they do stick in there just a little bit because there's a little catch on them. And you just gotta kind of angle them just perfectly. But they do come out, they don't snap, they don't break, and if they do, they are so darn easy to reprint. And you have so many darn possibilities here and different ways to go ahead and make the Kickstarter or use that Kickstarter or these Dragonlock tiles to make some fantastic terrain for all of your board games or even just your miniatures gaming or go ahead for your so tabletop RPGs. Check out some of these images of some of the awesome things that are available on this Kickstarter. Now, if you have a tabletop gamer in your life, you know that tabletop gamers love our dice. Why do we collect dice? I do not know, but I'm just as guilty as everybody else because we see that I have way more dice than I'm ever gonna need in my life, but I sit there and go, hmm, I could always use more dice. Or what I could use is I could use something new, different, and cool. And this is where coin sides comes in. Now, coin sides are metal discs, and these are large metal discs. And what they are is they allow you to do a different way to roll dice. Basically, instead of rolling dice, you're gonna spin one of these coin side discs. And these discs have different values allow you to represent the different dice that we may use as tabletop gamers. You have a four and an eight, that's gonna be on one disc. You have a six and a 12, that's on another disc. You have a 10 and a 20, that's another disc. And basically, they're gonna be raised up at different levels. So if you wanna spin 
a d4 you're going to spin the four sider that also represents the eight sider but the one through four are raised up numbers that show a little differently while the five through eight are lower numbers which allows you to spin these discs for the different values and every time you spin one of these discs you're basically going to spin it for like a second you're going to stick your finger down on the disc which is going to force it to stop whatever number is immediately to the left is going to be a number that you're going to use to represent whatever you rolled now this is a cool little interesting little thing and it's different than rolling dice First of all, it's really great for that friend of yours. You know who I'm talking about who likes to take the dice and roll them and the dice fly off the table every single time. Why do they do this? I do not know, but you know who you are and every one of you has one of these people at your table. At least I know that I do. But the cool thing about this is you simply just spin the disc and you put your finger down and it stops that number. And it's kind of a cool, interesting, little different way to roll your dice. Not only that, you can use these to represent hit point counters and life counters, which is a secondary use of which is so darn awesome, which is I want, the reason why I want to include this in the video where I was talking about those STL files and bleeding out your games just a second ago. Because you can use these as life counters because there's one of these discs that goes all the way up to 20. A lot of games, 20 hit points is a fantastic and very easy way to track hit points. And you can use one of these discs and simply spin it down to represent as you're losing hit points or spin it up to represent as you're gaining hit points and getting healed. So for your dungeon crawlers, your tabletop games or anything where you have multiple different heroes or need to have track or control their hit points, you can use one of these discs to represent it, or you can use one of these discs to go ahead and represent spinning and rolling the dice. Now it's different from dice, it's a cool different little thing and these things are really solid metal. And not only that, you can use them for different things such as the hit point tracker I already mentioned, but they also have the ability, the way they're designed, you can also use them as kind of decoration pieces. Now I know in the video I saw for this that if somebody wore them as kind of like a necklace decoration, but you can actually use them for different things because they're a solid metal and there's little loops in them where you can hook things through them and make really cool little display pieces. Now, like I said, we all love our dice. All of our, us tabletop gamers love our dice and we're always looking for the new, coolest, different die. So instead of having your new, coolest die, why not check out one of these coin sides? A little bit different, a cool switch and take on dice and a fun thing, a high quality thing from what I'm seeing, solid metal, a little bit different. And again, they represent anything all the way from your D4 all the way up to your D20, and if you don't want to spin them, heck, you can use them as life counters, which is something that I think is super duper awesome and cool. That's enough about Christmas gifts because it is October and it's time for Halloween, so it's going to start talking about some Halloween gaming. And one of the best things we can do with all of our gaming friends is play a good game of an RPG, such as 5th edition of Dungeons and & Dragons. And this is a great season to start a horror-themed campaign. Now, I am a huge fan of horror-themed campaigns because, for me, the 5th edition of Dungeons & Dragons, while it's a very enjoyable game, it has a very, very high fantasy feel to it. And basically, that means that the heroes are usually going to win. There's not going to be too many losses, not too much tragedy. The good guys usually win, and that's why I do occasionally enjoy a really good horror campaign. The nice thing about a nice horror campaign is the players get to do more of a whodunit type of thing. Players get to experience more of a different way to play, and the players feel like things are much more impactful with their decisions. Success feels much more tragic if the players fail at success, while success itself can also bring other challenges and other things, and players must make really hard decisions. And that's why I think that this is a great time to start a D&D campaign, and start with the D&D campaign, which is a full campaign all the way from first to 15th level, the campaign of Skin Deep. Now, Skin Deep is a 5th edition campaign that's going to take care of what, all the way from 1st all the way up to 15th level. And this is basically an adventure that starts off as kind of a whodunit. Now, I don't want to give away a lot of spoilers because like your average horror adventure, discovering the bad guys, discovering what they're up against, and going through the entire adventure is part of the fun of this. Now, the Skin Deep campaign book is a 300-page book, which is going to have lots of stuff in it, such as enemy NPCs, it's going to have magic items, it's going to have locations, it's going to have maps, and it's going to have all these things so a DM can go ahead and start this campaign and get it running for a group of players. Now, since this campaign is going to go through four different acts, and these acts play out over a long amount of time, this is going to be a campaign that's going to run for a long time. But the cool thing about this is this is a great adventure. I'm trying to avoid spoilers. I almost gave away a spoiler there. That's going to give you a strong feel of almost like a body snatchers. That's not too much of a spoiler. Mixed in with a whodunit because the adventure starts with a murder in a city. And the players are trying to piece together a murder as other things are happening. They're trying to piece together how this murder is going on. Is there a renegade cult? Is there a group of assassins who come to town? Is there something going on? Or is there friends their enemies and are their enemies their friends. This is some of the things that makes your horror based campaign so darn fun. As the players unravel things, they start realizing that they don't know who their friends are, 
who their enemies are and their friends they've held close to their sides, body snatcher style, may not be their friends when things come down to it. This is going to be a campaign that's going to travel the players across the lands. They're going to travel to other locations, again, no spoilers here, and they're also going to come back to a place that may have long repercussions that are going to be affected by the success or the limited success or maybe even the partial failures of our heroes. Because the thing I really enjoy about Mythos Adventures and these campaigns done by Sandy Peterson and Peterson Games is the heroes are not always going to win. Their successes are going to be somewhat a little bit less. They're not going to have the heroic victories all the time. Some of the victories are going to come at the expense of other things, and these are decisions that the players will have to make, and that's what I really enjoy. Giving the players agency and letting them know that, hey, your decisions aren't always good. You have door A, which kind of sucks, door B, which, yeah, it kind of sucks, or door C, which also kind of sucks, but you need to pick a door to go through because you need to advance the campaign, advance the adventure, and figure out exactly what's going on. And that's something I truly, truly enjoy in a horror adventure. Now, this horror adventure is fantastic for the simple fact that it's not going to be a hack em up, slash em up type of thing. This adventure starts with a true whodunit scenario where the players are trying to figure out what is going on through this murder, but it's slowly going to escalate and things are going to happen and players are going to find out there is an insidious villain that is trying to bring about ruination and, well, they're trying to bring about the end times as is very typical in any one of these horror campaigns. Now, like I said, this adventure book right here is going to be one volume that you can get that is over close to, I think the whole meat of it is about 280 pages. But the book itself is close to 300 pages, has wonderful artwork in it, has wonderful statistics for all these NPCs. NPCs that even once you're done with this, you're going to have a whole new, uh, this is kind of spoilery, but not too bad. You have a whole new race of enemies that you can bring into any one of your campaigns. Matter of fact, there is enough meat and bones of this adventure that you can actually pick through it, tear off some pieces of the meat to create and put in your own fifth edition campaign because this villain in here is very, very cool. It's very insidious, and you can literally drop this into any campaign. Again, I don't want to give away too many spoilers here because it's very awesome how it is written. If you're looking for a fantastic fifth edition campaign to start playing with your friends on October, a horror theme to help your friends experience a brand new campaign, first through fifth level, check out Skin Deep from Peterson Games. What if what if, though, you want to play a fantastic RPG with your friends, but you cannot sacrifice the time that it takes to bring out a long campaign system, such as Pathfinder, such as 5th Edition, or any of these other RPGs which are basically campaign-based? What if you just want to play an RPG in one night? What if you just want to play an RPG that takes anywhere from 3 to 5 hours? What if you want that to be a horror RPG for Halloween? Then look no further than the game of Dread. Now, Dread is a one-shot RPG, which is absolutely fantastic as a one-shot RPG. It is fantastic as a sci-fi RPG. It's also fantastic as a horror-based RPG because the game of Dread builds tension. And tension is what you need in any kind of setting where you want a true horror feel or you want a sci-fi feel. Because Dread, unlike a lot of RPGs where you're rolling dice and using these dice to make your statistics, this game does not use dice at all. It simply uses a Jenga tower. Every time a player wants to take an action in the game of Dread, whether it's a simple action, a medium action, or a really hard action, they're gonna have to make a certain amount of pulls from the Dread Jenga tower. Now, if it's a super easy action, it may just require them to make one pull from the Jenga tower. If it's a medium challenge thing, such as, for example, if you have to leap across from one building to an X, it's a six feet jump, but you're being chased by the horrible bad guy. Maybe it's the slasher, maybe it's the horrible villain who has the knife who's chasing behind, but you need to jump quickly to the next building while the DM is giving you this horrible description and raising the temperature, trying to describe to you exactly what's going on. This horrible crazed killer is chasing after you. You might have to make two pulls from the Jenga tower. Oh, I'm doing horrible here. This makes great cinema when you watch me pull from the Jenga tower slowly. It does great cinema. What if though, <laughs> I'm gonna knock over the Jenga tower really. Early. What if it's a horrible situation where you need to jump across this building? Maybe it's an eight foot leap. Maybe you have a twist in ankle. Maybe the bad guy is right behind you chasing after you with a knife. Then you gotta make three pulls from the Jenga tower. And the interesting thing about this game is everything that happens, all the events, Everything that the game master is describing, everything that the players are doing, and everything that is occurring is going to keep going, and the tension and the pace of the game is going to keep rising and rising and rising. Nothing bad happens to our heroes 
until somebody makes a pull from the Jenga tower, plug your ears, and the Jenga tower falls. The moment the Jenga tower falls, that player is going to be the next person who's going to die. Now the Game of Dread is a wonderful, absolutely fantastic and super thematic RPG. The great thing about it is, like I said, this is a fantastic one-shot RPG. You can literally send an email as a DM or as a GM to your friends before they show up for game night and say, just fill out this questionnaire. This questionnaire is going to be your character when you show up. You're simply going to belly up to the table and we're going to play the game. The moment the players sit down, the game starts. This is what's so awesome about it. You literally sit down at the table, everybody brings in their filled out questionnaire and we just simply take those questions and those are your characters. Questions can be as simple as, what's in your right pocket? Why is your left ankle sprained? Why do you have a paper towel or a towel wrapped around your hand and what caused that bloody wound on your hand? All these things will build into the adventure that's all been generated by the game master who's going to create this scenario over this three to four hours one shot game. You do some wonderful things such as end of the world circumstances. You can have scenarios such as, well heck I'm not going to lie, you can literally steal from books that you've read before. You can steal from fantastic books, horror novels. You can take a game or a book such as The Dark. If you haven't read the book, it's a fantastic book by the way. You can take the book The Dark and have the players play out in that scenario. Again, it makes a great one shot. You can take books such as Moving In or books such as Thirst. I'm sorry, I think it's actually called They Thirst. But all these are great horror movies that can be great inspirations for a dread game. Or you can just make it up and just make it as the players are just a group of campers. They show up at this camping spot and one of them might be a werewolf. This is a cool thing about dread. It makes a fantastic one shot game. And the wonderful thing about the game is there's no funky stats for players to figure out. There's no experience charts, no weird charts that players have to figure out. There's no weird daily calculations or anything that needs to be figured out by all the players. You can literally sit down with the players at the table describe what's going on, ask them what they do, and depending on the actions or the decisions or the answers they give you, tell them to make a couple pulls from the Django Tower. Keep doing this until somebody manages to knock over the Django Tower. That player is going to be next to die. They don't necessarily die next. You want to keep the drama and the pacing going, but they know they're going to die next, and it's up to the players to build up the Django Tower all over again. But this time, when we build up the Django Tower, all the players who are still alive need to make two pulls from the tower before the adventure and the action continues. You know, the tower is ever so closer to falling over again, which basically ensures that no players can be left off to the side for too long. And basically the dram drama is going to ramp up as we bring about the end of the story for the game of Dread. Halloween wouldn't be complete without a zombie game, and no game does the zombies or the zombie apocalypse better than Dawn of the Zeds. Now, Dawn of the Zeds is a tower defense game, and this is going to be a tower defense game that can be played solo. It is absolutely fantastic as a solo game, but it can also be played with multiple players, whether it's cooperatively or as a team-based game where one player is going to control the Zeds, and the other player is going to try to play the heroes who are trying to keep the town center safe from the marching army of the Zeds the zombies who are trying to take over the little town center and if they ever get through this tower defense game and manage to make it to the town center the zombies are going to win the game now the interesting thing about this game is this game comes with a phenomenal amount of heroes and the player is going to pick a certain amount of heroes at the start of the game and all the heroes bring different things such as special special powers special abilities and different ways that they can help protect the city and as we play the game rounds are going to go by and different things are going to happen through an event deck and through fate cards and well, you can also play the game in harder difficulties where you can actually try to create a cure for the zombie apocalypse. Good luck with that. But basically what's gonna be happening is these regular zombies are gonna be advancing through these tracks, just basically moving up down these tracks, moving every single round depending on the draw of cards, or maybe even super zombies are gonna come out and these super zombies are extremely tough and powerful. While the heroes are doing their best to protect the town center, whether it happens to be by putting up barricades, by using special abilities, by going out there, well, I guess a horse won't be doing what I'm about to describe, but maybe the sheriff is going to use his movement and his actions to go out here and shoot the zombies and maybe stop the hordes from reaching down in the town sweat town center. The challenge about the game though is why this game is so darn hard is this game emulates a zombie apocalypse so darn well because the fate deck and the events are going to make things happen and going to create the game space where this tower defense game is going to constantly ramp up. The game starts off super easy where you're kind of going, yeah, I don't get it. What's the challenge here? And then about after about four or five card draws, you're going to be like, oh, maybe we should do this thing. And after about 10 cards, you're going to be like, dear God, guys, we are going to lose if we don't figure this out right now. So the game has this wonderful feel of the zombie apocalypse game, which slowly ramps up this wonderful tower defense game, which is great whether you want to play it as a cooperative game or play it as a competitive game. That's the game of Dawn of the Zeds. 
a friendly word of warning because you are about to become horrified. Whoa, okay, I'm done. Horrified is basically a family version of a Halloween version of Pandemic of the Game, and this is a one heck of a great family game to play this Halloween. Horrified is a cooperative game for one to five players where players are trying to work together kind of in a Scooby-Doo type of manner. Well, I shouldn't go as far to say a Scooby-Doo manner, but it's a very extremely light game where the players are working together to try to take out one, two, or maybe three of the various different classic horror movie bad guys in an effort to save the town. Now, the cool thing about this game is you're gonna play this game differently every single time you play it because you're gonna pick two, three, or maybe even four different bad guys that you're gonna be going after, and your only objective is to defeat every one of these bad guys. Now, every one of these bad guys has a different way that they're going to be defeated, different things that require them, but it matches a typical classic horror movie vibe of what these bad guys are. Dracula, you wanna put stakes through his heart. Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein, well, you can all figure it out. It's standard horror movie tropes here. And these bad guys are gonna be moving across this board while our heroes are working together to try to defeat these bad guys. Now, the way we're gonna defeat these bad guys are by claiming tokens. And these tokens have various different colors on them, various different slight thematic effects that are gonna appear in different locations. For example, this token right here will appear in the tower. This token right here is going to appear in the inn, which is right there, and that's easy for me to find. But we're basically gonna move around, trying to interact with the board, and trying to defeat these bad guys before either this track gets all the way up to here, or before our players fail to defeat these bad guys. Now, the cool thing about this game is this game has a nice horror feel to it, but it's very light and it's very, very easy for this game to be played for families. This is a great family game because it plays for one to five players. And if you can play games like Pandemic, you can play the game of Horrified. Every single player gets their nice little hero that they're gonna get at the start of the game. All the heroes have their own special actions. And we're basically going to move around the board trying to stay away from the bad guys, which are gonna be activated by these cards right here, which are gonna tell you what kind of actions the bad guys are gonna do. Maybe they're gonna come after you, maybe they're gonna go to different locations, try to create their effect that they're trying to do. Maybe they'll even go to various different locations and attack the various citizens of the city. But the things that they're doing is they are basically just trying to accomplish their goal before the heroes complete their goal. Whoever completes their goal first is gonna win. The great thing, like I said, is this is a fully cooperative game. The artwork is not too scary. It's pretty darn light. It's nice and easy while you still have a nice feel of a nice horror game. Again, I said it has a nice little Scooby-Doo feel. It, And the reason why I say that is because Scooby-Doo is very light, very family friendly, and the game of Horrified is exactly the same. It's great for one to five players. It's very enjoyable because it's quick to play, super darn easy to explain, and the nice thing about it is the game has a whole bunch of little components to make life very easy. You just simply hand one of these cards to a player and say, hey, these are the actions you can take on your turn, these are the actions that the bad guys are gonna do, and we just need to beat them before it beat us. That's the game of Horrified. What if all you want is just a little bit of social deduction for Halloween? Then look no further than One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Now, One Night Ultimate Werewolf is a game for three to seven players. It does play better on the higher end spectrum of the player count, but basically this is just a super fast playing social deduction game. Matter of fact, your average rounds are gonna play for about five minutes, maybe 10 minutes top, depending on how much talking you're gonna do between the rounds and how much you're gonna spend time trying to decide what roles you're gonna include in that specific game. Because the basic idea of the game is at the start of the game, every single player is going to get a roll. And these rolls are gonna be shuffled upside down. And of course, before you start, you're gonna pick a certain amount of rolls based on the player, player count. You're definitely not gonna dump all the rolls in the game, unless you're just kind of crazy. Don't do it, it doesn't work, it breaks the game. But the basic idea is, depending on the player count, you're gonna take a couple different rolls and you're gonna shuffle around. Every single player is then going to get their roll, and each single player looks at their specific roll without showing the other players. The trick here is that one or possibly none or maybe multiple of the players are going to be werewolves. And the werewolves know who they are. And the only thing they need to do is survive the entire round. If at least one werewolf survives the entire round, the werewolves win. If the werewolf is sussed out by the other players, the other players can decide to shoot the werewolf with a silver bullet, and that's gonna end the werewolf, and that means the heroes are gonna live. But the cool thing about this game is it plays fast, and the next cool thing about this game is that all the different rules you throw into the game are gonna change the rules so darn much. The alpha wolf plays differently than the standard werewolf. Players such as the, nope, you can even have a mystic wolf. Players such as the villagers have no special powers. Players such as the minions have special powers to change the rules. The mason is gonna change up the rules of the game. The village idiot is gonna change up the rules. The tanner is gonna change up the rules. The prince is gonna change up the rules. The hunter is gonna change up the rules. 
all these different roles are going to change up how the game plays and add so much to the variety of the game. Your average games are never going to play the same, whether it happens to be a game with the Insomniac and just a couple different werewolves and a couple different villagers, or maybe you may have the Village Idiot, a Minion, the Insomniac, the Mystic Wolf, the Alpha Wolf, and a whole bunch of different things. It's all going to change how the game plays. That's what's so great about this game. It's a wonderful social deduction game where players are going to use an app and the app is going to tell the players to do various different things. Once the app is done talking, the players have anywhere from three to five minutes to talk, to bluff, to deceive, to talk through the process and just figure out who the werewolves are, whether they're being honest or if you happen to be a werewolf, you probably don't want to be too honest and say, me, werewolf? Bob's a werewolf. I saw him. He's a horrible human being. I'm the mystic. I know he's a werewolf. Make sure you pick him. That's the game of One Night Ultimate Werewolf. If you enjoy your social deduction, but you don't like the lying and the bluffing, and you just don't want to play a game with an app, look towards the game of Escape from the Aliens in Outer Space. Now, Escape from the Aliens in Outer Space is a hidden movement deduction game where all the players are humans trying to escape from a space, space, space station that is slowly falling apart and is about to be destroyed. Oh, well, actually, not everybody's a human. Did you ever see the classic movie, John Carpenter's The Thing? It's the 80s version where there's an alien parasite which is slowly infecting everybody inside the frozen Antarctic and it's trying to infect all the people so it can go about its evil ways. Well, that's basically what you got here, except it's on a space station in space because all the players are gonna have this movement board. And this is a dry erase board. We all come with our dry erase markers and we're gonna use this to signify where we are moving. Because if we are the humans, all we are trying to do is get to one of the escape pods get on the escape pod and escape. The trick here is though is that when we reach the escape pod, we need to draw one of these cards from this deck and it may say that the escape pod is working and we may successfully escape or it may say the escape pod is broken which means life has just got much more difficult for us because we must now make it to one of the other escape pods. You'll notice that there's a whole bunch of sections of this board here because you have sections of the board where there's no noise and there's sections of the board where there is noise and if you move into one of the sections with noise, you need to draw one of these cards. One of these cards can give you an item which is gonna help you. One of these cards can tell you that you must announce to the entire table of all the players exactly which square you're currently in, or one of them may allow you to lie about where the noise has occurred, and you may say there's noise in any one of the spaces on the board. Well, so you're not gonna lie and say it's one of the spaces that can't make noise, but you get the rough idea. You're basically, as a human player, trying to get to one of the escape pods, while you, as the alien player, you're trying to infect all the other players because if you infect all the other players, you win the game. But you're also, with your other infected, trying to hunt down the humans because if you hunt down the last of the humans, infect all of them, the space station is yours and you now win this great game of deduction, hidden movement, and deep bluffing as you try to work from the start all the way to the escape pods. Now the cool thing about this game is that there are multiple, multiple different maps. All these maps are gonna play very differently change up the gameplay, change up the strategy, change up the tactics, and make sure that this is a game that's gonna have one heck of amount of replay value. And this game does play all the way up to eight players, making this this great, highly replayable game that's gonna be Escape from the Aliens in Outer Space. If a cooperative card game is more in your style, check out the Apocrypha Adventure card game and a cooperative game for one to six players. Now this is a complete story-based game where players are going to play through an entire campaign. And these campaigns are extremely horror themed. They're gonna have different things and different scenarios and different fields from them and different kind of end world or horror circumstances in this dark world that's hitting with our own modern times. Because this is a modern game that matches a lot of modern TV shows, such as TV shows such as Supernatural, or if you want to go back, you can go even look at shows such as Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but you get the basic idea. Our modern world exists, and there's a hidden underworld of darkness that heroes are doing their best to try to defeat. And the way this game is going to play is every single player is going to pick a hero, and their hero is going to come with a starting hand of cards. You're going to evolve your hand of cards by getting things such as halos, which are going to give you extra powers, or you just may modify your current hand of cards, and you need your hand of cards to go to things such as visiting different locations. You may have locations of hope and locations of doom, and your actions may allow them to flip back and forth from the hope and from their doom side, which can make things much more challenging for our heroes. And basically, you're gonna go to these locations, you may encounter things such as, you may find a monster truck, which may help you in your adventures, you may encounter a horrible band of death head moths, or you may just eventually encounter the major villain that you're hunting down, whether it happens to be a Wendigo, 
or there happens to be a horrible thing such as, well, maybe the EMT is not a good choice, but maybe the hay man, maybe a kazoo, maybe it's a labyrinth that you're trying to hunt down, maybe it's pollution, or maybe it's just an evil robotic machine which has taken over all the cars that are now going to be driving you crazy, literally, pardon the pun, in your effort to hunt down and win this game of Apocrypha. Now this game has a very interesting flow to it because the way the game is going to play is you're going to roll dice for all your actions. Doing different things is going to require you to defeat them, and to defeat them you need to roll a certain amount of dice and they're going to have a target number to defeat them. For example, if we happen to be in this location where we need to defeat these death head moths, if we can go after, whether we can go after red or go after blue, these are various different stats. I'm not going to explain them, that's not what this video is about. But if I want to go after the red, I need to beat a 15 or higher. If I want to go after the blue, I need to roll a 12 or higher. Well, we see that I'm going to roll three red dice, and I'm only going to roll two blue dice. So looking at things, my odds are in my favor that I may be able to defeat it if I roll three red dice, because that's all I can roll. But I only have two blue dice to roll. But on top of that, I can play cards in my hand, which allow me to start adding more dice by playing these cards to a discard pile. For example, this one allows me to roll one more blue die. So now do I discard a die? or discard a card to roll three blue dice and try to be a 12, or do I keep all the cards in my hand because my cards in my hands is my life, or do I just go for three dice and try to get a 15 or higher? If I fail, various bad things are gonna happen. If I succeed, various good things are gonna happen, but we're basically trying to go through all these different locations, encountering the grand storyline of what's gonna occur while we're hunting down trying to find the grand bad guy and win the game in this campaign-based game. Now this game is not like your traditional campaign-based games where you go through adventure, 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 adventure through a progressive storyline that you have to go the way the storyline is laid out. This is much more like a seasonal TV show where the heroes are gonna go across the different seasons, across the different environments and different locations by their choice. One week we may hunt down werewolves, the next week we may be hunting down undead, the week after that we may be trying to hunt down a goddess of the jungle who's trying to bring about the end of the world because she is tired of pollution but you get the basic idea the game of apocrypha is a cooperative game that's going to give you tons and tons of replay tons of variety and it's going to create this wonderful campaign system where you create the campaign of the game of apocrypha of course, if cooperation isn't your thing this Halloween, there's always, always the classic game of Cthulhu Wars itself. Now, whether that happens to be the smaller, lighter version of Cthulhu Wars Duel, or the bigger version of Cthulhu Wars, which uses these grand, big, gigantic miniatures, giant miniatures, I saw it was a funny word to say it every time I got a smile, but this is your classic dudes on the map, area control war game because in this game every single player is going to take a faction based on the various writings of hp lovecraft whether it happens to be the faction of great cthulhu whether it happens to be of shub nigroth or maybe it just happens to be the sleeper or one of the other almost 12 different factions that are available for the game now this is a dudes on the map area control game where the eventual objective is to bring ruin and destruction to planet earth great old one style because in this game players are going to be trying to gain area control of this map and the way we gain victory points is by controlling these gates if we happen to control these gates these gates are going to give us a victory point so the objective is to use your big giant monsters or your not so big monsters the smaller guys and your objective is to eat up the opponent and try to steal the gates away from them so you can take control of these gates which are going to give you victory points Obviously, we're not going to hop over. I just didn't have a guy there put it there. But you get the rough idea of how the game plays. So basically, this is going to be a game of war and destruction. But the great thing about this game is how asymmetric it is. Because every single faction in this game plays different from every other faction. You have your factions that go out there and just like to be your bruiser factions, which are just going to stomp on the opponents. You have your factions which like to spread across the board very, very quickly. You have your factions which do strange things, such as controlling the pace and the flow of the game. Or you have your factions that are just going to change up the rules and the strategies and the way the game plays. And every time you play the game is gonna be different because your faction is never gonna play the same way twice because of how you're gonna build up your spell books. Your spell books are gonna give you powers and as you unlock these spell books, it's gonna allow you to do different things across the game. Of course, the grand objective of the game is to get your doom counter all the way up to the most amount of victory points, to score the most amount of victory points, and win the game. But at the end of the game, there's gonna be a couple extra victory points that players may unlock, which means that some players may end up giving victory for this game even when it looks like they have defeat in their hands this is one of the greatest asymmetric area control games because it is so darn asymmetric but for some reason the game is balanced extremely well this game plays all the way from two players if you use the cthulhu wars dual portable version of the game or you use the granddaddy version of the game which will play all the way up to i think we're up to 10 players now especially if you get the right maps 
and maps that will change up the way the game plays, just like the factions themselves. That's the game of Cthulhu Wars, whether it has a duel or the granddaddy game of Cthulhu Wars itself. If dice are more your thing, check out Elder Sign, a one-day player cooperative game that can be played as a basic dice game or as my personal favorite way to play the game is by playing the very thematic expansions, especially one of my favorites, which is Omens of Bites. I probably like it because it takes place in Alaska. I live in Alaska, and that's kind of a cool thing. Heck, we can even be really, really cool and see that we can even go to the Port of Anchorage. I can do that just by getting my car. <laughs> okay. But what this is, is this is a dice game, and what the players are trying to do is they're trying to defeat one of the great old ones. Before we even start playing, all the heroes are going to agree which great old one we're trying to defeat. Once we decide what great old one we're trying to defeat, all we're trying to do is just seal him up by putting out enough Elder Sign tokens to go ahead and shut him down. But the cool thing about this game is this game is going to have various different locations. And when we visit the different locations, we are simply just trying to accomplish the challenges that happen at these various different locations. To accomplish these challenges, we are going to use our investigators, which we picked at the start of the game. We all have different investigators we can choose from, have different stats, different abilities, and different cool things they're going to bring to the game. But the basic idea is we are going to roll dice at these different locations, and we are trying to match the symbols on these locations. If we match the locations by using a mechanic of rolling dice and discarding dice, locking dice, etc., etc., we're going to defeat these locations and we're going to claim rewards. If we fail to do so, negative things are going to happen, but we're also fighting the time pressure of this clock because as this clock advances, more and more negative things are going to happen until we eventually lose the game. And different great old ones have different things that are going to affect the clock, but that's the basic idea of the game. So we basically go to a location and we roll a certain amount of dice. We're going to play cards which may give us red and yellow dice, but basically most of the time we're going to be rolling the green dice. We roll the green dice and we're looking for the symbols here. For example, hey, I got two hourglass symbols and I got a one hourglass symbol. Now I could decide to lock one of these dice and try to roll this again to try to get the two symbols and fail miserably. Or I can use special powers or special cards or special different things to try to accomplish my task or even maybe give me re-rolls in an effort to defeat the challenges on these cards. And if you defeat the challenges, you successfully get through the deck. Now, I most, like I said, enjoy this by playing the campaigns, which create more of a story-based game. But even the basic game itself is kind of interesting because you're playing inside a museum and it uses its own special deck of cards. And this deck of cards is going to have various different locations in the museum. And we're basically going to be trying to shut down a great old one in the museum or you can play the various different ones. There's one that's for an Egyptian. There's the Omens of Ice, which is based in Alaska. There's also expansions for this game that add different variety, different things to the game, and even extra dice, which are going to change up the rules of the game. Now, this game is cooperative. It plays for one to eight players. And the great thing about this game is it's balanced very well among all those player counts. All the players can greatly enjoy the game, especially since the turns go very, very quickly. You're simply rolling dice, looking at results, and the next player can go. And the more players you play, it keeps the difficulty going. By adding more players, it means the Doom Clock is going to advance much, much quicker. So a wonderful dice game, a phenomenal amount of replay, thanks to the amount of great old ones in the game, the amount of heroes we can have in the game, and the fact that the game is going to lay out differently every single time you play it. Doesn't take up a lot of room. The whole game fits in a very, very small, nice, neat little package box right here. And even in this box, I have tons of expansions, tons of gameplay, and this wonderful dice game that plays from one day players. That is the game of Elder Sign. If team-based hit movement is more your thing, check out Fury of Dracula, a team-based game where the players are working together in a team against one other player who's going to control the horrible, evil Dracula himself. And the objective of our heroes, just like the standard Dracula novels, is to drive a stake right through his heart and save poor Mina Harker from the wiles of this horrible, horrible demon himself. Now, this is a hidden movement game, and now the interesting thing about hidden movement games is the players who are controlling the heroes are going to be moving around the board with their mentors, going to go into different locations, experiencing different events, and try and get resources to hunt down the evil count himself. But the evil count is using a hidden movement mechanic, and the way he moves is going to be using these cards. His miniature is never placed on the board unless he's attacking, and you just want to add a little bit of extra theme into the game. But the basic idea is that Dracula player is going to play cards down here on this section of the board, and as we move to different locations, we're simply going to advance the cards, signifying our trail of the locations that we have been to, as the players are trying to track down and figure out exactly where the count is. Now, as the count is going about their trail, they're also laying traps down for the heroes. Some of these traps may be bodyguards, and again, these are unknown to the heroes till they go there, or some of these may be other vampires that we've laid down in waste, because our only goal as Dracula is to create enough dread across the board once the dread track gets far too high 
the heroes have lost the game. So this is a time pressure. The players have a couple weeks in game time to hunt down the count and put that stake right through his heart. And when they encounter him, they're going to use fight cards and do various different things. But the interesting thing about this game is this game is going to be played in a day phase and it's going to play in a night phase. During the day phase, we're going to go through event cards. And the nice thing about the day phase cards is we can look at the top card and see if it's going to be a good card for the heroes or if it's going to be a bad card for heroes. The negative thing about the night phase, though, is when we go through night phase, we always draw cards from the bottom. So the heroes never know if they're going to get a good hero card coming up next or if it's going to be one of the bad Dracula cards, meaning that the game adds a lot of pressure onto the players. So the players controlling the heroes must work together cooperatively in an effort to figure out what the Count's trail is, figure out where he is, get ahead of him, and defeat him by putting a stake through his heart before he puts enough dread across the entire countryside, brings doom and gloom, and our heroes have lost the game. Now this is a team-based hidden movie game for two to five players. One player will always call, control Dracula, while the other player or players are going to control the heroes. That is the game of Fury of Dracula. Now, if you enjoy the classics, that means a classic worker placement game, especially a worker placement game for two to four players, check out Abomination, the Heir to Frankenstein. Now, Abomination, the Heir to Frankenstein, that should be pretty obvious in the title, but the heroes, well, we're not heroes in this game. We're definitely the opposite of heroes. We're actually being blackmailed by the classic Frankenstein's monster in an effort for us to work together. Actually, not work together. We're fully being competitive here. But we are working to rebuild Frankenstein's next monster so the monster itself can stop being lonely and have a partner in life. And basically what we're going to do is we are going to send out our workers to various different locations across the city taking various different events. These events can help us restore our humanity or most of the events are going to take our humanity away as we send our workers out to these different locations to do things such as collect body parts, collect organs, well, it's going to get a little bit dark because we may go into a dark alley because we need fresher body parts and make our own body parts ourselves as we slowly use, lose our humanity. Because in this game, we must be tracking our humanity, and the higher our humanity goes, the more victory points we get. The lower our humanity goes, the more victory points we lose as we try to raise up our reputation, which gives us more workers, as we try to raise up our expertise because we need our expertise in an effort just to put these body parts together and in an effort to go ahead and animate this next creature of Frank. Frankenstein monster. But here's the thing about this game. This is a very much a very thematic worker placement game because at the start of the game, you are going to build an event deck, which is going to come with 13 different cards. And you're going to see there's a lot more than 13 cards. It's a event deck. And these events are going to do various different things, such as maybe there's going to be public executions that are going to occur. But the important things is the monster himself is going to start adding extra pressure to our heroes. So our heroes are working competitively in an effort to score victory points by building his monster or we can just chuck that all out there, keep our humanity, and work towards the inspector who is doing his best to hunt down the monster and defeat the monster. Because this is a game that offers multiple paths to victory. While we can lose our humanity, we can also save our humanity by going to different locations that allow us to, to atone for our sins, gain victory points that way, creating this wonderful, interesting game. Now this game is extremely great because it really does match the theme of Halloween, but it also matches the theme of the classic story of Frankenstein and the story of Frankenstein's monster. Frankenstein's monster just wants a companion because he's lonely living out throughout the years all by himself as a freak, as a monster, as a horrible abomination. So he's trying to blackmail the heroes into creating his next creature that is going to help him live a less lonely life. So do you work to build that monster or do you save your humanity? That's this worker placement game for two to four players, Abomination, the heir of Frankenstein. Next up in traveling back into the world of H.P. Lovecraft is going to be the Arkham series of games. Now, I specifically here have Arkham Horror 2nd Edition, which is my personal favorite of the three games I'm about to talk about. And since I'm about to talk about three games, I'm not going to bother unboxing this one because all the three of these games look a little bit differently, but they're basically the same idea. And basically, we have Arkham Horror 2nd Edition, my personal favorite, Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, not my favorite and my least favorite of the three, and also the game of Eldritch Horror. Now, the difference between Arkham Horror and Eldritch Horror, I basically rate them pretty much the same in my mind. But basically, these are cooperative player games that are extremely thematic, and these are games that are all about the theme. The big difference between Arkham Horror and Eldritch Horror is that Arkham Horror is very more smaller. It deals with a small town having problems with great old ones, and Eldritch Horror is much more globetrotting. It's a worldwide 
problem with a great old one is trying to wake up and destroy the entire planet. But the basic idea is this is going to be a game where players will be playing across a board, whether it's a city or an entire planet, and their basic objective is just to hunt down a great old one and manage to defeat it. We're going to go to different locations. Events are going to occur based on cards that we're going to play, cards that may be in locations, ancient beasts and enemies are going to wake up and start traveling across the land and we're going to have to defeat these creatures go into other planes of existence while we're trying to work together cooperatively to figure out how to defeat this great old one if we're unable to defeat this great old one before it wakes up at least in arkham horror second edition we're going to get one last final battle against the beast where we're going to roll dice and hopefully we can defeat it and banish it back to its world before it destroys all of creation now arkham horror Eld elders hoarder and arkham horror third edition are awesome games. These games play with multiple players. They're really great with multiple players with multiple different expansions. They're gonna to add tons and tons of replay and a fantastic amount of variety of these games. Basically, at the start of the game, every player picks their own unique hero among dozens of heroes. They're gonna pick a great old one they're gonna combat among dozens of great old ones. And we're basically gonna build the board, build the locations, go across these areas and try to discover the secrets of taking down these great old ones before the final gate opens up the great old one enters our world and brings ruin to all of the planet. These are absolutely great, wonderfully themed Halloween games, fully cooperative, that play great all the way up to eight players. Next up is the Legendary Encounters, specifically the Alien Deck Building Game. Now this is a cooperative game to play with one to five players. The average playtime is going to be about two hours. But if you are a fan of the classic Alien series of, of movies, you are looking at one of the best representations of the classic franchise that you will ever play. This is a deck building game where the players are going to play through the movies. That's one of the best things about the game. You're going to pick one of the four movies, or if you get the expansions, you can start playing through some of the books or some of the side stories. And the basic idea is that you're going to relive these encounters. Now, this cool thing about this game is this is a deck building game. So our players are going to be going to different locations to build up their deck in an effort to defeat whether it happens to be the Queen Alien, the Queen Alien, the Queen Alien, or, wow, that's pretty redundant. We're always trying to kill the queen alien, but hey, it's awesome because it is alien. Now the basic flow of the game is the player is going to hand of cards and they're going to use their hand of cards to interact with the board. Basically the HQ is going to be set up with a different amount of heroes based on what movie you're playing. Now since every one of the movies is going to play out differently, I didn't put out the cards here, but the basic idea is you're going to have a barracks full of cards that you can buy. But additionally, you're going to have this advancing track of cards, which can be cards such as events, these can be cards such as biohazards that may happen, or maybe skip that, and we'll go to xenomorphs that are going to appear. The trick here is that all these cards are going to come into these locations face down, so our heroes never know exactly what is in every one of these locations. And as these cards move down these tracks, the players must work together by playing their cards from the hand to examine what a card is and try to defeat it before they get down into the combat zone. If one of these cards gets down to the combat zones, they're going to start attacking all of our heroes, and our heroes are going to start taking wounds and the effect of strikes. Now, some of these strikes may be flesh wounds, but some of these strikes may get much more egregious and may become wounds that our players can't even heal because every one of our heroes is going to have a hero card which only has a certain amount of hit points. When you run out of hit points, you're dead. And not only that, you may end up getting a face hugger on your face, which may mean you're eventually gonna die once that face hugger card comes back in your hand. It's basically game over, man, for just for you. Now the game is basically designed as a one to five player, cooperative game, but there's rules in the game for one player to take over the alien queen avatar and go ahead and attack the other players. Now it's not 100% balanced. As a matter of fact, the alien player is a little bit overpowered, but it does add a lot of replay of the game and a lot of variety to an absolutely fantastic deck building cooperative game that really fits the theme of alien. If you're looking for the theme of alien to play on this Halloween, look no further than legendary encounters, alien, the deck building game. Now I just want to give two more special mentions to games and the reason why we have these quick special mentions is because they're very similar in gameplay to games I've already mentioned. For example, we have Planet Apocalypse, which is a tower defense game, but instead of coming in a small package like Dawn of the Zeds, this one is a much more grand game with giant miniatures, multiple different playing boards, but it's the basic same idea of a game. It's a tower defense game where the heroes are trying to work cooperatively together to defeat a grand evil invasion which is trying to take over our planet. Whether it's a zombie evil invasion or it's demons from another realm, it's basically the same idea. You're gonna be rolling dice, you're gonna be defending areas, and you're trying to take down these demons before they completely obliterate our planet. And then we have the game of A Touch of Evil, which is very similar to the Arkham style games. 
But this one's a little bit different in the fact that it is much more thematic. It's not always quite as balanced as the Arkham games can feel. And this one does offer a little bit of a competitive play style. So if you want that story style game of like the Arkham games, but you want to play it more competitively, then you can definitely play A Touch of Evil as more of a competitive game. Basically, it's just like the Arkham Store, the Arkham style games. You're going to pick a final baddie, whether it's instead of it being a great old one, it may be the Headless Horseman, it may be one of these classic bad guys, and our heroes are going to work through going through this town, a basic small town, or when we get extra expansions, an ever-growing town. We're going to go to these different mm -hmm. locations. We're going to have these thematic encounters trying to gear up an effort to find the bad guy, find out where he's hiding in his lair, hunt him down, and go ahead and defeat him. But that's the game of A Touch of Evil. When you compare these games to the other games I mentioned, A Touch of Evil versus Arkham, they can basically be very much interchangeable for me. But I'm not going to include them in this video as much because they are very similar to the other games I've already mentioned. Same thing with Planet Apocalypse. It's very similar to Dawn of the Zeds. It's a tower defense game, very, very similar. But if you want something that has a bigger board presence, a lot of miniatures, and a little bit slightly different, more heroic version of the game, that's going to be Planet Apocalypse. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed this first Monday show for the month of October, focusing on Halloween gaming, plus a couple mentions on some up upcoming Kickstarters and maybe some great Christmas presents for the gamers and your family. Hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed this video series. If you have any comments or questions, make sure you leave them down in the YouTube comments down below. I will definitely answer them as quickly as I can. You can also feel free to email me at offtheshelfboardgamereviews. That's O-T-S-B-G-R at gmail.com. I'll definitely answer your email as quickly as I can. If you enjoy the channel, if you enjoy the content I put out, think about supporting the channel over on Patreon. Just one little dollar in the tip jar can help me keep covering my costs and help keep the channel growing strong. Not only that, people who back the channel over on Patreon get advanced views of videos, get to see videos that are going to be much more advanced, that are locked behind a time wall that can be anywhere from two weeks all the way up to a month. You get the early preview of those videos. If you enjoyed this video, click that like button, click that subscribe button, and as always, thanks for watching.